we're trying to help people live healthier lives by making healthier living more fun. If it's more fun, it's stickier. If it's stickier, then people stick to it and people actually at scale create really good outcomes for themselves. Welcome back to the Fit Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Venari. Today, I'm joined by Kiva Dickinson, founder and managing partner of Selva Ventures. In this episode, we discuss mega trends across health and fitness. Kiva shares his framework for investing in emerging CPG brands. Plus, we talk about what's next for Selva after closing a new $34 million fund. Let's get into it. The Fit Insider Podcast is brought to you by Jack Taylor, our exclusive PR partner. More than just PR, they're creative storytellers and brand builders who actually understand the health and wellness industry. To learn more, head to jacktaylorpr.com slash fit. That's F-I-T-T. Hi, Kiva. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Joe. Good to be here. Yeah, man. Looking forward to today's conversation. You got kind of a lot going on and maybe a lot to, to catch up on. So for folks who aren't familiar, um, listeners, maybe just start by introducing yourself and tell us about uh, what you're working on. Cool. So I'm the founder and managing partner of a firm called Selva Ventures. Our mission is to invest in brands that make their consumers' lives better. And the way we do that effectively is to lead and strategically co-invest and seed in Series A companies in the world of health and wellness across food, bev, personal care, beauty, vitamins and supplements, and pet. We look to kind of over time broaden our horizon of what wellness means and what fitness means and find ways to scale that beyond physical consumer products. But most of what we've done to date is across the world of consumer packaged goods, brands like Mudwater, Native Pet, Midday Squares, and One Skin, to name a few. Prior to that, was a private equity investor at TPG and a venture investor at Circle Up, and was constantly drawn to the world of health, health and wellness and early stage investing. And you know, eventually in 2019, got inspired to go out on this journey. And you know, we're four years in and bigger and stronger than ever. Yeah, I think there's obviously a lot of things that resonates with me, probably with listeners as well, whether they are somebody who works in the health and fitness space at a startup, at a more established company, investors, and whether or not these things, they certainly are not mutually exclusive, but also people who are passionate about the space, right? They see all of the various verticals, applications, categories, uh, kind of, you know, continuing to multiply and expand and reach new heights. And certainly there's a fit in different kind of ways that investors can then step in and, and help these companies, you know, not only get launched, but scale and, you know, Selva filling that void in so many ways. You've been in the investing game, right? From a, a couple different angles at a couple couple different stages. So getting to the place where you you started the firm in 2019, what drew you to this, you know, seed series A kind of looking and saying, this is where we think we can potentially add the most value. This is where some of these emerging trends are at potentially an inflection point and, and maybe how you thought about, you know, the ability of, for them to, to reach really escape velocity and go on to, you know, be kind of venture scale companies. Yeah. Great question. Um, I was working at Circle Up in 2017, joined them to help them lead a, really a change in their business model from helping to connect companies in the consumer world that needed capital with investors who were interested in being part of these companies in some sort of syndicated way. That could go anywhere from institutional raises to equity crowdfunding. And Ryan and Roy started the business in 2011, coming out of the world of consumer private equity and seeing this hole in the like, call it one to $25 million sales threshold. Uh, and so I joined, I got the chance to be a part of some amazing investments for them. Business called Nut Pods, it made some plant-based creamer that we brought BMG into, and then a uh, business called Liquid IV that we led the Series B in and eventually sold to Unilever. And frankly, when, when we were looking at those companies, uh, I couldn't help but ask myself, like, who were the investors before us and, and what did they see in order to bet on this business before we did? And quite often, uh, it was a really inconsistent group of investors. Like there, there was not the same seed and series A landscape that you can see in technology and healthcare within the world of consumer. 
And so quite often there were family offices and angel investors that were leading these rounds and, you know, taking meaningful equity positions and strategic roles within these companies because the consumer funds wouldn't go early and the venture funds wouldn't really do consumer products. And so it became clear to me after a while that like having looked upstream and seen this really unstructured landscape and me myself look at early stage consumer brands that I wanted to invest in, but was told were too early for us. And then seeing those companies with the proof points that we had at the time go on to be successful, I started to wonder like, hey, folks, folks should be investing. Like this, this is a stage that is interesting. This is a stage that may actually offer better risk reward than what we have access to. And that, you know, stone started to gather more and more momentum for me when I started to see that these companies themselves actually had a real pain point. The most promising companies didn't know who their first call would be at that stage. And quite often they were having a much harder time pitching to find that right investor and getting much less help from that investor than you would expect that they should for one of the highest potential consumer brands in their kind of cohort generation. And it, it eventually dawned on me like there needed to be a seed and series A stage comp firm. I looked around and didn't see the one that was doing it the way that I believed would take shape. And I was looking, frankly, to go work for them, Joe. Like I, I didn't really want to start. <laughs> I didn't really have some grand plan to start an investment firm here. It was like, who is doing this type of investing? How do I learn from them? How do I specialize? And when I didn't see anyone doing it, uh, I decided I had to kind of take the plunge and, and give a shot at starting it myself. Yeah, that's really interesting. And as you're walking through that, it's, you know, it's, it's also, I think, sometimes overlooked the extent to which starting a fund is like, you know, obviously you're going out and you're backing founders, but like you're a founder and like you're trying to find product market fit and you're out pitching LPs and trying to like sell them on the vision and, and do all the things that a founder is ultimately doing as well from like the, the startup or, or product side and looking at the landscape, putting some type of structure and standardization, like to what these companies were already experiencing, right? To your point, it's like, they're calling friends, friends of friends, people who are like, maybe they're a partner at a different fund who couldn't do the deal because they weren't far enough along at whatever metrics that weren't clearly defined maybe in the industry to the extent that some of these later stage funds, you know, felt like they could do it. And you have like, where in the world of like SAS, right? It's like all oh, very established, very almost an equation and everybody knows what it is. They look for the benchmarks and it's all about getting an allocation. Now you're basically going in and saying, okay, we have to define what these categories are. We have to define what the metrics are. We have to define what the management team to some extent needs to look like. So with that, what, as you're going through that, it's, you know, it's been more than a few years to this point. How did you begin to then assemble? Okay. These are the frameworks. These are the metrics. This is what does matter to us as it relates to these categories, having the experience of being at the, the later stage and being able to apply it to some of these, maybe a little bit earlier, earlier stage companies. Yeah. So basically we wanted to have a framework that would help to explain or at least in some way bring objectivity to what can sometimes be a really subjective exercise of evaluating these consumer brands certainly there's quantifiable health statistics and nutrition facts certainly there's quantifiable statistics and performance but then there's also this additional kind of magic of the brand resonance and you know trust that you have for the founders and we wanted to basically build all of this into like a package. And the thought that I had was, you know, let's, let's try to build a framework that could explain the last 30 big successes in consumer brands, because it, it effectively like a back test almost like if our, if our framework would have told us like, yes, invest in our X bar, invest in buy, invest in simple mills, invest in vital proteins, then you know, that could bring some good standardization and, and outlook for the future. Obviously, couldn't be too rigid, couldn't be too overfit to those. But, you know, I, I sat down with, you know, some of our, our earliest and most supportive LPs and, and helped kind of big, build a, a system 
that we eventually named the 5M framework. We tried to name everything after M and tried to like kind of <laughs> build it in such a way that we'd remember it and people would use it. Uh, and so, you know, the first was a uh, mega trend. Like what is the big change in consumer behavior that prov provides the rising tide that this company could benefit from? That might be, you know, low sugar, that might be plant-based, that might be, you know, people being more thoughtful about alcohol consumption, whatever it is, it wasn't meant to be fat. It wouldn't be like, wouldn't be like keto diet. It would be low sugar. And those were things that we were pretty sure would still be really relevant 10 years from now, if not more so. Then the second was matter. And, and this was a question of what is the problem that this product solves for the consumer? And why does that matter to the consumer? Because we believe that brands scale eventually virally and organically. If you're solving problems for consumers and consumers are sharing that solution with their friends and family. The third is management. And that's to say that like, why is this team and the product that they've created superior to what else is out there, both the incumbents and the other disruptors? One of the things that investors often don't think about is you're not just making a bet on this company disrupting the incumbents. You're also betting on this company versus the field. If you bet on Magic Spoon in 2019, that might be a great bet. They're the first mover in cereal. But you're also betting on them over every other cereal disruptor that's going about it a different way. Uh, from there, you have momentum, which is effectively like what are the what are the metrics, what are the traction, and what is the capital efficiency of this company that's going to show you know, it could be sales velocity, could be repeat purchase data, whatever it is that's showing that this isn't just growing, but growing in a way that can continue. And then finally, it's market, which is to say that if you got all of the above right, then is this a big enough opportunity to matter? And will you be able to get your money out? And we try to basically score like all of these companies that we knew in the early days to see like, you know, what's a 20 and what's a 30 and what's a 35? And what does that mean for like where we'll typically lean in and where we'll lean in really hard? Uh, and over time we've kind of tweaked and iterated and saved all of the scores we've ever put towards a company in our investment process to help us get calibrated. And it's actually really helpful to look back and see like when we missed one, not just did we miss it, but why did we miss it? Like, did we really underestimate the market size or did we really underestimate the founder or did we not understand what was that key insight of the problem that was solving for the consumer? All of those learnings allow us to get better in our process going forward. Yeah, super smart and super instructive, I'm sure, as you're going through and kind of plotting these these learnings and these data points, like where the scores fall and maybe what you missed and and hopefully not, not to miss something like that again. I also think there's this level of, you know, in hindsight, you mentioned like something like RX bar. It's like, yes, because they sold and what they were able to do from like, building a community, coming up in the CrossFit gyms, really, you know, breaking through with the simplicity of the ingredients and the the packaging, like a lot of things now that are so kind of standard across uh, different, you know, brands. But it's like, it may be obvious now, right? But it wasn't obvious then. And how do you go about kind of deciphering beyond this scoring, right? You have the framework and the scoring to say like, this is something that we're willing to kind of push the chips in on when at in the moment scores aside, it just doesn't seem obvious. And it is maybe something that you're somehow drawn to that such that you're willing to write the check. Yeah. I mean, the, the beauty and pain of this business is that the good ones are never obvious. Yeah. And when everyone is running towards something uh, that's actually a pretty good time to catch yourself and check yourself and, and maybe look in another direction or ask a few more questions. The best investments that I have ever made and I have been a part of, I was fortunate to see some incredibly smart and experienced people say no to. And that has been a powerful learning that carried through with me over the years to say, I know that smarter and more experienced people than me are capable of saying no to something and being wrong. And that means that there should not be pure, obvious, 100% conviction. 
and the lack of 100% conviction or the presence of somebody disagreeing with me over an investment should not be the reason alone that we don't make the investment. Mm -hmm. There's so many reasons that you can say no in such a long shot risk on business. And at the end of the day, our, our job is not to be 100% sure about anything. It's to be as sure as we can and then super reflective about like why we were right or why we were wrong to make our decisions and model better. I had the chance of meeting a, a guy named Sam Hinkey years ago. He's like well-known basketball executive who's gone into the world of business. And he was so obsessed with decision journaling, writing down why you made the decision that you made, not just what decision that you made, so that you could go back and actually evaluate whether you're right or wrong about things or whether you're just getting lucky. And that always really stuck with me. And so like, we can't hide from the fact that we have, we have memos where we went on the record about things we thought we were going to happen in 2019. And if everything that we wrote has nothing to do with the success of the company, but the company outcome is good, we shouldn't be patting ourselves on the back. I think that, that, that discipline approach is something that is challenging to do, to hold yourself to, to hold the, the firm to as it continues to grow. And then make sure that you're constantly coming back to and checking in and write, not just doing this scoring and writing these memos and then putting them in a, a filing cabinet, imagine that in the cloud somewhere, um, never to be seen again. So being disciplined about coming back to them. And around that point, how often are you getting conviction about a space and then trying to identify the companies versus having the companies come in and maybe doing the diligence and trying to get conviction almost after the fact, are you proactive in seeking these out based on the, the trends and areas that you're excited about? Or is there a balance? Yeah, many of the best investments that we've made have come from being proactive. And we certainly try to be in all respects, it's easier for an investment to get through our investment process. If it comes from a place of proactivity, simply because there's so many components to the category and theme that we already have conviction in that it's not this uphill climb to get there. But one of the beauties of getting to talk to so many smart, high conviction entrepreneurs all day in a reactive way, introductions, cold inbounds, warm inbound, warm intros, whatever it may be, uh, is we get pitched on all of these ideas that we haven't thought about before. All of these challenges that that we may, may not have realized are really important and affecting a growing and growing base of consumers every year. So often a reactive conversation with an entrepreneur will turn into proactive pulling on threads within the problem set and theme that they're associated with. And that will turn into a proactive investment elsewhere or revisiting that investment idea later on. Many of our partnerships come after knowing these entrepreneurs for I don't know, three to 24 months. And that's a long time to learn about not just who they are, but you know, what are the themes that they're building against and what's the key insight that, that they believe in the world that other people disagree with. And it takes time to come around to their line of thinking. But you know, as we learn, as we get up to speed, that you know, can get closer to matching their conviction and ultimately diving in. It's been interesting to hear, like, again, listeners of the podcast, it's not so foreign to them, right? Like the size of the wellness industry broadly, the size and scope of the individual categories, the kind of emerging categories within it, the the way that in some ways very fractured and siloed industries are now overlapping, right? So you're getting all of this kind of uh, overlap towards more holistic health and wellness and founders that we talk to a lot of times are saying like, you know, investors, they, they, you know, a lot of them, some of them, they just don't get it. They don't get the problem. They don't get the industry. They don't get the consumer, the consumer behavior. And I'm sure obviously this is something that kind of led you to, to wanting to, to fill this void what, because when they come to the table, it's like, Hey, we already, we got it. We, we already are agreed on this shift in culture, this shift across behaviors with that. It also becomes challenging not to get too excited about some of the emerging categories, behaviors, products. How do you prevent against that, right? You see, it could be the period of time where it was like 
everything was meditation and mindfulness. Everybody's launching a mindfulness app. There's all this content. There's all the hype investments, sleep and sleep fitness, you know, all the different applications and ideas around that on and on personal care. Um, so as you're either arriving at these because of personal interest or you're meeting founders who are maybe introducing you to their, you know, insight around them, how do you not kind of get overly excited, overly ambitious about, you know, the, the emerging category? Yeah. There's this book that I read um, probably like 15 years ago called Crossing the Chasm by a guy named Jeffrey Moore that basically talks about how technology companies scale from like innovators and early adopters to ultimately hitting the mainstream. And he talks about this gap between early adopters and the early majority like the, the more uh, willing to adopt, but still kind of mass customer that prevents high, pro high potential promising companies from really reaching their potential. And in being in this business for a number of years, I've, I've found that the same shape of curve can be applied to wellness adoption, fitness adoption, and Frankly, the same place is a, is a common kind of graveyard of, of companies that had a really, really promising start, but weren't able to kind of hit the big time and, and reach mass scale. And quite often, it's identifying when a company or brand is moving really fast and, and growing and resonating with consumers, uh, you know, whether there is some kind of like relatability or potential to meet that mass consumer who potentially isn't talking to the early adopter. Yeah. Um, what we like to think of in those times is like, why might this be a false positive? If something is growing really fast and picking up steam, why might be it? Why might it look like a false positive where it, it isn't going to cross the chasm, even though it has great momentum. The times that we see that happening often relate to some concept of price and complexity of value proposition, meaning there's only so many people who can spend on a hyper luxury product. And so the speed at which really affluent high resource folks adopt these products may be a false positive for how many others can actually afford them. Certainly that's not always the case. I mean, I, I would probably say that like percussion massagers looked like this like elaborate luxury years ago and Theragon and yeah, is now a pretty big company. And so high price companies can cross the chasm in that way. The other piece that we often spend more time on is value proposition. And this is not as much about resources as it is about the knowledge of the consumer and how much knowledge and passion is necessary for them to understand what the product or offering is doing for them. If you take a biohacker and try to have that biohacker recommend their wellness routine to, you know, a suburban fit 32 year old guy who's just trying to kind of stay healthy and is willing to spend money on his wellness you might find a little bit of talking past each other, a lack of relatability and a lack of understanding, or at least some degree of skepticism as to what that biohacker is doing. Is it actually, is it actually working? Is it actually worthwhile? Do I have enough time to do that? And so often actually we're asking ourselves like, is there some chain of people that is going to allow that biohacker to recommend to somebody else who recommends to somebody else who recommends to eventually convince that suburban guy who's just trying to live a healthier life to buy that product or opt into that thing. And often it plays out the same way that a game of broken telephone does. Like the harder, longer, more complex the message, the more of a mess it gets to at the end of the telephone. And so we then push these brands in these fundraising conversations to articulate like you have you have one sentence, you have a tweet, you have a text message, you have, you have a, a single sentence to articulate why somebody should be doing this. If it takes 10 minutes to articulate why you are solving a problem and that this problem should matter to the consumer, it's hard to believe that the value prop is ever going to reach main stage. 
But if you're able to distill it down, and I like to say, like, if you can make a light bulb go off really quickly in a consumer's mind, then that can reach a mass audience, even if it takes a lot of time and money to adopt. Yeah, I think that's really interesting and, and well put, like this idea of, in some ways, it can be challenging and and there's a lot of friction in making a lifestyle change, especially related to wellness. You know, you you ultimately from the mission standpoint, want to invest in companies that help people live a, a happier, healthier life. And sometimes taking that step is challenging, right? So you, in some ways, want to remove that friction, make it easier. And if you're not able to articulate what that value proposition is, and you're not able to acquire customers and, and convince them of what it is that you're doing, uh, yeah, it's just not going to play out in the way that is going to be favorable for anybody really involved. Hey, everyone. We'll get you back to the show in just a second. But first, I wanted to tell you about our exclusive PR partner, Jack Taylor. Honestly, this one's a no-brainer. We've known the Jack Taylor team for years. They work with some of the most innovative health and wellness companies. We're talking Whoop, Athletic Greens, Hyperice, and many more. Jack Taylor has an extensive industry network, knows how to work with high-growth companies, and really invests in building long-term relationships. I know this firsthand because they're Fit Insider's PR agency, so I can confidently recommend them, and I do all the time. From startups to more established brands, they go beyond pushing product to help companies truly thrive. To learn more, head to jacktaylorpr.com slash fit. That's F-I-T-T. Now back to the show. We actually go as far as to say, Joe, that uh, we're not trying to scale the healthiest or the highest performing things in the world. We are trying to help make healthier living more accessible and more fun and more habit forming. Effectively, like everyone, know, I like to say everybody knows that if they only ate fruit, lean meat, leafy greens, and exercise for two hours a day, they would be way healthier than they are right now. Yep. The reality is that is boring and not habit forming. Very few people that I know are able to make that an everyday lifestyle. It is the fun, tasty alternative to the unhealthy thing that they're doing. It's the exercise routine that you look forward to and rush to in the morning or after work. These are the things that form habits. These are the things that bring people together. And these are the things that ultimately impact public health at scale. And so we're trying to help people live healthier lives by making healthier living more fun. If it's more fun, it's stickier. If it's stickier, then people stick to it. And people actually, you know, at scale, create really good outcomes for themselves. Yeah, I think that's really important. And it's, it's something I certainly think about a ton, both from, you know, the conversations we have on the podcast, who potentially we're writing about, what we're writing about in the newsletter, who we're, companies we're investing in. And it's almost a tension at times between, is this thing going to make healthy living more accessible? Is it going to make it fun? Is it going to make, you know to your point, bring people together around making kind of like positive decisions. And that's that's ultimately what you want to have happen, right? You need this cultural shift to make healthy the status quo, the normal, the accessible thing. Right. It's like those things are oftentimes products, technologies that cost money where the habit itself is free. So do you ever find a tension between, you know, investing in companies that are putting a... a kind of a, a cool brand or a package or whatever distribution on this healthier version of something that might otherwise be free and just broadly accessible as it is? Or is it like just a win-win if people are doing it and they're able to pay for it and the company's succeeding and in increasing access, like that's right in the sweet spot. And it hopefully that leads to like this broader shift. I think I'm just realistic enough about human nature and the way people express their identities and some of the like you know, ruts that they get stuck in without help. Like you can, you can pay a personal trainer to stand there and tell you what to do, or you can use a free app that does the exact same thing, but you're more likely to show up if you pay that personal trainer to stand there and hold you accountable. And if that works for you, I don't think that's exploitative. I think that's good. <laughs> you know? So like, yeah, you can, you can go for a hike, 
and it would be free or it would be the cost of getting getting to the hike. But if you buy a, a Patagonia sweater or a new pair of, of hiking boots, you might be more excited to do it. You may have made this investment in yourself that you want to amortize over time. You may feel better when you're doing it. That may allow you to project a new form of your identity. Like one of the really interesting about habits talked about in the book, Atomic Habits, is don't go do something. Be the kind of person that does that. Like, don't go for a hike. Be the person that goes hiking. And that means probably investing in products that facilitate that identity. I have huge respect for people who can do it really minimalist, minimalistically, who can grocery shop, cook their own meals, engage with them, not need a lot of brands. Like, I think that's honestly wonderful. I have no judgment at all for those people. I just don't think that's the majority. The majority of people need help. They're looking for community, they're looking for ease, and they're looking for ways to find a self-identity that they like and that can be healthier. And I do think that these products, by being more engaging and making healthier living easier, actually solve a big problem for people in that journey. Yeah, I agree. And that's, you know, that that's the the place that oftentimes we get to as well, which is just like if it can help one person, obviously that's not the goal from a business perspective or at scale, but is it helping people? take the steps in the direction of being the healthier version of themselves, right? To the, to the James Clear kind of anecdote. Totally. Um, and you want to, in his words, continue to cast that vote to be that person and, and kind of show up every day. Yeah, we need the companies, the brands, the products that enable that lifestyle and hopefully nudge people and continue to push them in that direction. Um, changing gears a little bit because selfishly, I could just talk to you about the various health and wellness industry trends and brands and verticals, I think, for the rest of the the conversation. But getting maybe a little bit more into the weeds about the firm and the fund, the the new fund. So recently announced a $34 million second fund and thinking about now, hey, at least from the outside looking in, you can tell me if this is correct. It seems like really good traction, really good validation of the model, the framework that you discussed, the the sweet spot and the the kind of landscape and like, hey, we just need to do more of this. Like we need to deploy more capital. We need to potentially lead more rounds and we need to be more proactive with the things that we're noticing. So maybe now in your words, how did the how are you thinking about the second fund? How did it, it come together and and how if it is different than the first fund, uh, what does it kind of look like going forward now? Yeah, some similarities and some differences. On the similarities front, you know, one of the biggest problems that early funds or first funds face when trying to scale is you know, what made them successful isn't possible as they grow because they need to either increase check size and therefore invest in different types of companies or increase the number of companies that they invest in and therefore be more stretched for time and be unable to invest the amount of time that they did to help the companies in the first month. And so uh, thankfully, there's a lot of really great content out there that helped me try to build a plan to avoid that trap. And the plan was to effectively deploy fund one as if it were funds two, but with smaller checks and surround ourselves in those rounds with friends and supporters, collaborators that we really trusted so that when we got to fund two, which would be larger, we weren't investing in more companies and we weren't investing in any less time in those companies to be able to ultimately help them. So that meant like doing more work than was sometimes ultimately necessary. Like we would make a $500,000 investment in a $3 million round and we would try to do as much work as the lead investor did. We would show up to board meetings. We would offer advice. We would help them with hiring. We would help them with getting in touch with retailers. We would help them rebuild their financial model. All these kind of extra credit things that aren't common for a co-investor to do. And, and we just tried to, from the beginning, say like, well, we're not co-investors. Like we're, we're lead investors that just write this check size and soon we'll write a bigger one. And so that has allowed us now with fund two to get that good feedback from entrepreneurs that we partnered with to say, hey, we really like it when you do this. We really don't like it when you do that. And you know, these are all things that will factor into how we go to business, you know, how we go to market with our, with our second fund. And what we've had so far is you know, four investments that we've led or co-led. 
And, you know, that, that probably means going forward, like we're, we're a lead investor much more often. And, you know, we take pride in that. We take that role seriously and we ultimately mean it. It's more about delivering resources and less about just delivering capital. Um, in terms of differences, you know, I think my comfort and expertise really sat in food, beverage, vitamin supplements prior to, to starting Selva Ventures. And so naturally that's where we spent a lot of our time in fund one. And over time, I think there was a, a realization from my standpoint that the, the firms that I look up to the most in the world of, the, in the world of consumer, um, like BMG and L Catterton to, to name a couple have really done a great job diversifying across beauty, personal care, pet, um, categories, one that affect that same consumer two that happen to have, you know, really attractive unit economics, um, three that have, you know, really powerful network of acquirers. And in order for us to be able to play a real role in that, rather than me try to learn those categories from scratch, I wanted to bring in teammates who had expertise and a natural affinity for that. So about a year and a half ago, we hired a woman named Madeline Kaplan. She leads all beauty and personal care investing for us now. Uh, she came from, from Goldman Sachs and Smash Capital. Uh, and she's done an amazing job, you know, led our crown affair investment, works really closely with one skin and has helped to kind of scale our expertise horizontally rather than just kind of throw more people at the same problem of finding, you know, better food and beverage and, and wellness solutions. Yeah. It's awesome to see how you're evolving and growing the firm, because I think there's a the last couple of years, at least there's been a lot of excitement and hype around like solo GP and like operating the fund by themselves and, you know, maybe being more nimble and small in terms of the overall fund size. But now thinking strategically about, as you said, growing into different verticals, who's going to lead them? Where does your expertise lie? How do you continue to make sure that you're providing the value that you're hearing from the founders, right? This is what they want and this is what they need. How do you think about continuing to grow the team, the firm? Do you have ambitions to be VMG Al Catterton scale? Do you want to, you know, continue to be more so in this world where it's on the smaller side? How do you think about kind of growing it into the future? Yeah. Uh, the, the intention has never been for this to be my firm. It has never been for it to be a, a kind of solo GP scenario. It, it has always been to build the world's best health and wellness focused investment firm that can partner with companies at the early stage. In many respects, that is the, the L Catterton or BMG for the early stage. We don't want to ever find a situation where we have to say no to things that we previously said yes to and saying yes to those things are what made us successful. That would be the ultimate shame if we, if we write one to $5 million checks. And that ultimately puts us on the map as a, as a partner for these companies. And then years from now have to say no to them. That would, that would, that'd be really discouraging and kind of, kind of anti the, the reason that I started the firm years ago. But I think the, the development is not just a, a crew size. It's figure out ways to help these, these companies better figure out ways to, uh, whether it's um, build stronger relationships across the retail ecosystem to help these companies get on the map with retailers faster and smoother than they otherwise would, build a network of advisors that have been there before and can mentor these companies in a powerful way. One thing that's kind of on our roadmap that's a string I've been pulling on a lot is uh, all of these founders will operate best if they have a great coach. It's absurd to me that the best professional athletes on earth have just an army of coaches that are helping their every little thing. And founders are almost viewed as like weak if they work with an executive coach before they hit a level of scale where it's kind of affordable or expected. And so one of the things we want to be able to do is like build a network of coaches that are like vetted and great and really specialize in working with this type of company uh, and help our, our founders access those coaches. 
So we're, we're really noticing like various different problems that these founders face, hurdles that get in the way of them reaching their potential uh, and trying to build an engineer, a, a kind of support system and resource base that really fits all the needs that one of these companies would have at the early stage. And we think over time that will lead to two good things. Like one, the best founders hopefully will call us first. We want them to aspire to partner with us. And that's a big responsibility that we have to grow into. Uh, and two is that we're never going to make these companies successful, but we hopefully we hopefully can like make it a little bit easier for them to succeed, maybe a little bit faster and feel a little bit more supported on their journey. And I think if that happens, we've done our job. Yeah, I think it's the the challenge, as you pointed out, is like if the things that work for you that get you to the next level, you ultimately have to stop doing. Man, that would be super discouraging. But oftentimes that it happens because firms get bigger. They they started out by being the you know most impactful investor on the cap table. They went above and beyond. They delivered all these resources. They were differentiated. They were strategic. Then they grew and they had to worry about their business, right? And so they had to leave a lot of these things behind. So I think it's super important that you're you're not only mindful of that now, but see that as kind of integral to the success long term and and stick to it because it's much needed in the in the ecosystem, especially for founders. Um, when it comes to looking at the broader economy, the impact, not only, so you have the the kind of second fund closed. Now you have to get out there. You have to deploy this capital yeah. and you're seeing kind of, you know, whether it's the companies themselves running into a host of different challenges in some ways creates a ton of opportunity, especially for early stage investors to get great value, uh, provide even more value for those companies. But there's other concerns in terms of, are they going to be able to reach kind of the same trajectory? Are they are consumers going to be spending on this? The the kind of rebuttal to that is like wellness is recession proof in some ways, right? It's growing into this category that consumers aren't willing to kind of uh, pull back on that spending, whether or not that's true. Potentially, we'll find out. Um, so, are you seeing any challenges now as it re re relates to the the deals and opportunities you're seeing? And do you anticipate uh, can any any challenges uh, in the near term? Yeah. What a, what a wild time. I mean, the past, yeah. the past two years have just, I mean, these are <laughs> to be written about and taught about in, in economics classes for years to come. And it's a, it's an amazing crash course of, of how to make every mistake in the book and, you know, how economic cycles really not just play out in practice, but how they like feel in your gut day to day and the mistakes that can make when your, your gut, you know, pushes you to places of irrationality. I mean, I, I, I feel very grateful to have been in this seat as a capital allocator during this time because of just the magnitude of learnings. I think there's two things that have gone on counteracting forces that feel really strong, that I feel really high conviction on. On the challenging side, you have a moving of the goalposts that happened so violently and so quickly that it has left a ton of really crippled, promising brands in its wake who have been unable to adapt fast enough to this shift towards efficiency and profitability when every sign just pointed to digital and growth. That's been very hard. I mean, there's some brands that arguably should not have been funded the way they were. There's other brands that frankly uh, kind of lost a game of musical chairs and just like had the music stop at the wrong time with a cash balance that just was unlucky to be relatively low at that point in time. Either way, it is a time to be compassionate and empathetic to the entrepreneurs building those businesses. But I think collectively, we would agree that it's, it's producing a healthier set of gold posts for the future. You know, an industry that is not so focused on growth and proof to the next investor and more focused on building a sustainable model that makes sense. Uh, frankly, the metrics that have come out of it, which are metrics we've always believed are the most important, are now super prioritized, like gross margin and repeat purchase. They are not only just what the investors care about now and what makes for a more profitable company, they're also the signals that it's working. The point of building one of these products is not to raise a series B. It's to change consumers' lives. It's to solve problems for consumers. 
So if you're rewarded for that with a high gross margin, that's a proxy of value you're creating. Like what you, that, that the products that you give to your consumer is, is worth far more than the sum of its parts. That's what a high gross margin means. A high repeat purchase rate means that you're solving the problem effectively such that people want to come back. People want to have that habit formation that we talked about earlier. So I think these things are good, even though they're challenging. And I think the shifting of the goalposts, I wish it had not been so violent, but I think we will look in the future as a necessary evil to create more good outcomes. Now on the positive side, I think what we've seen is just like doubling down on wellness in a huge way. It is not where people are looking to save money. And I think that's really positive. You know, CPG is supposed to be recession proof because, you know, people don't go out for dinner, they don't go on vacation, but they keep grocery shopping. What we didn't know is premium CPG. We didn't know boutique fitness. We didn't know all of these new things that frankly were created sometime between 2008 and now. And so we never got to see all of these categories flow through a cycle. And thankfully, the first time we're seeing them flow through a cycle, we're seeing the consumer vote with their dollars and say that this is maybe the most important thing in their life. Yeah, the, the aspect around not only the wellness, but now getting into like what people think of as preventative care, preventative wellness, preventative health, um, even down to the boutique experience, some of the premium CPG products, supplements, nutrition, all of those things. Yeah, I think it it, it has been interesting to see the level of you know, commitment and the importance that people are placing on that and their, their dollars are really, you know, kind of speaking to that, um, around the goalposts, it, it has been interesting as well to see it play out that, yes, I think we we're arriving in a place where we are more realistic. We are looking more closely, things are under a microscope and we're getting to the heart of the matter in terms of like, what really matters? Are these business models intact? Can this actually go about delivering yeah. the impact that, you know, it's promising? The interesting piece, uh, not coming from somebody who was in the kind of investing seat, right? Being an operator who's now an investor in some ways still an operator. It's like the founders were simply trying to reverse engineer the metrics that VCs wanted because VCs wanted the markup. And so it was like, in some ways, we're just giving you what you told us you wanted in the deck and like, is that sound financials? Is that sustainable? Is that like going to deliver some type of return or exit at the end of the day? Like, we don't know. We're just trying to play the game that we told, like we were told to play. So in some ways, shaking that out of the system and having investors like yourself who come to it with like, hey, we need to be rational. We need to be empathetic. We need to be thoughtful. We need to add value. Like I'm hopeful and encouraged by seeing more of that just like across the board uh, and hopefully continue to move things in the right direction. I am too. I am too. I mean, I, I think there's definitely been less capital available to this space in the last 18 months. And the capital that is still here, the capital that has entered during that time, I think is positive and high conviction capital. And my hope is that collection of folks, that community that we're fortunate to be a part of can do a good job as leaders to show that other value add positive investors should play a part in this wellness challenge. It is a, it is a really profitable way to deploy capital. It's also a place to be deploying that you can feel really good about. Uh, we haven't talked about, but you all at fit industry insider do such a great job sharing the, the like macro health impact of this industry as a whole and the problems being solved around, uh, chronic diseases and mental health. I mean, it, there's, there's a lot of wood to chop here. And I don't believe that this is something that the public sector can solve on its own. Entrepreneurs need to create new solutions to help make healthier living better, more accessible, more engaging. This is all part of it. And we play our role as investors to allocate resources to that cause. Yeah, it's both challenging and exciting, right? To be in that seat, like so much work to do, so much more to push through, like certainly making progress. Uh, I think potentially we'll, we'll actually wrap up there and just briefly talk about for those founders, right? Who are trying to get these companies funded, maybe trying to get on your radar. What's the best, easiest way to do that? Some places, hey, we only want warm intros. Some places, hey, hit us up. Like we're open to connecting with everybody. Um, where do you kind of sit on that spectrum and what's the best way to get in touch? 
Yeah, I think I think warm intros are always a great way. Um, you know, finding finding mutual contacts and you know sharing your story and you know ultimately that added kind of trust of of going through someone we know. There's there's no doubt that that matters. One of the things that we fundamentally believe into is just like content. Like we are huge consumers of content, and we are you know we try to be uh, you know sporadic creators of content. But we really respect a founder who goes and puts their thesis on the record publicly and puts it out there for criticism, shares the story, the ups and downs of building it. There's some folks online who do a fantastic job of, of doing that. And, and frankly, those, just, those people are magnets for curious folks like you know those, those on our team just want to learn about that person's journey and want to learn more about what, what is giving them that much conviction. And so, um, you know, I'll, always will, always will look at a cold email and have had some great relationships come out of that, but, but often it's the, it's the content and online connections that come from sharing your perspective first, uh, that, you know, get us excited to pull on that thread that you've been working on for a long time. Yeah. And I would say for folks who don't already know, like you mentioned, you're putting out content, some of the stuff that you put out on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, some of the thought leadership and just general perspective on the industry is super valuable. So if folks don't already, definitely encourage them to follow you, you know, check out the website, keep an eye out for the, the content that you are putting out. We'll have all the kind of links in the show notes and make sure to point people in that direction. But yeah, and wrapping up, just really grateful for the time today. It's been exciting and inspiring to, to see you continuing to build the firm and the impact that you're having. So yeah, thanks for making some time. Thank you. Huge fan of, of every, every piece of content you guys put out. I think your, your newsletter is probably the, the best like summation of what's interesting to people in our world. And so have been a, a longtime reader and listener and um, just a really cool honor to get to have this conversation with you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. One more thing before you head out, help us spread the word. Take a minute to rate and review the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, or share this episode with a friend. And if you like conversations like this, you'll love the Fit Insider newsletter. We send it every Tuesday. The link is in the description. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you back here next week.